Welcome and thank you for coming. So the teaser for tonight was what if humanity stopped urbanizing? What is the role of cities in promoting economic growth? And importantly, and I think uh, this will be a significant part of the talk, what are the lessons for Christchurch uh, in terms of the rebuild from other cities that have faced these challenges? So tonight, as you know, is the 2013 Conflict Memorial Lecture, and it is part of our What If series that has been extremely well attended over the recent weeks, and there's more to come, of course, over the rest of the uh, sessions. For those that aren't aware, uh, John Combiff was the inaugural Professor of Economics here at the then University, Kentry University College, and previously an honours graduate of the department, later moving uh, overseas, of course, to become one of New Zealand's most well-renowned uh, international exports. This lecture, traditionally, and I've attended a number of them over the years, brings leading economists to Christchurch to provide a public lecture as well as facilitating other discussions and being involved in wider debate about the issue of the day. And in our current environment, it's hard to think of a name or a scholar whose research would have greater relevance to the situation we all find ourselves here in Canterbury. <coughs> Professor Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard, where he also serves as the director of the Talkman Centre the State and Local Government and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He is one of the foremost world experts in urban economics, and this interest extends to thinking deeply and publishing about the recovery of cities like ours from natural disasters. In commentary published in 2011, he particularly made reference to Christchurch as one of the cities to watch as the rebuild provides, as he quoted, a unique opportunity to rethink urban thought. Let's hope we can lift our game to realise that ambition here in Christchurch. We have a way to go, I think you'll agree. Ed is an innovative thinker. He's played and continues to play a key role in the reinvigoration of urban economies and the academic commentary thereon. As you'd expect, he has a stellar publication record and is ranked in the top 40 economists in the modern world. His CV is uh, voluminous, I won't dwell on it at length here, but importantly, he's renowned as a great communicator and attracts large audiences. And I think, I hope we'll see Sir Joy's dialogue with the audience after the formal part of his speech is over. Uh, on the uh, board there on the screen, you can see uh, a note about his book, The Triumph of the City, which is a very readable and I'm told accessible account of how cities, our greatest modern invention, make us richer, smarter, greener and hopefully happier. As you would expect, and the colleagues in the department inform me that uh, Professor Glaze has been in an extraordinary high demand during his visit to New Zealand. He's already delivered another, a number of lectures, met with the leading opinion thinkers and will be having further discussions with <coughs> policy makers, politicians and Sarah over the next few days. Uh, he's also Sir Douglas, the Sir Douglas Vines, visiting professor at the Auckland Biz Business School, and will be visiting Auckland and Wellington as well as Christchurch. So, would you join me, please, in welcoming <laughs> Professor Glazer to yeah. tonight's talk? Of the, of the city. Um, 
The, um, there are cities whose past was made by disaster. Right? That is the Chicago Home Insurance Building. This is a little bit too loud, I think. Let me, let me turn this down to the back. The back is a little bit high. Um, this is the Chicago Home Insurance Building. It's called by some the first skyscraper. It is, of course, one of the buildings that was created after the great Chicago fire. Right? And it is an example of the inventiveness of cities and the way that cities enable those collaborative chains of, of creativity that are responsible for humanity's greatest hits from Athenian philosophy to Facebook. This building, Home Insurance, is, uh, is often called the first skyscraper, and its architect, William Byron Jenny, is often called the father of the skyscraper. Um, it is, however, a subject of a very lively debate among architectural historians. Of course, there are you know, innumerable lively debates among architectural historians, uh, and for good reason, because this is actually not a true skyscraper. Skyscraper meaning a tall, bear, a tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. Only the front two walls that you see here are, uh, have a load-bearing steel skeleton. The back two walls are traditional uh, load-bearing walls. And indeed, uh, it was hardly the first tall building with a load-bearing steel skeleton. Right? There were industrial buildings in Europe and the UK that preceded this building. There were plans for similar buildings that circulated among architects both in Chicago and elsewhere before Le Baron Jenny put up his own building. So there's a, a huge debate as to whether or not Jenny or Louis Sullivan or Daniel Burnham or any number, Adler, Root, any number of the architectural geniuses who worked in Chicago after the Great Fire, whether or not they're actually deserving of the title of being the father of the skyscraper. But I submit to you that any attempt to find the father of the skyscraper is a fool's errand. Because the skyscraper, like pretty much everything else that our species has done that is worthwhile in our, in our history, has been a collaborative invention. All of these characters knew each other. Sullivan and Byrne were both apprentices in Jenny's office when they were young. All of them used the same ideas. They stole uh, ideas from each other. They employed the talents of the great fireproofing engineer, Peter B. White. They borrowed and exchanged, and collected them. Because of the city, they created this invention. This is what cities do that makes them special. They enable us to learn from, from one another and to create things collaboratively. That's what Chicago did in the wake of the Great Fire. That's what one hopes Christchurch can do. That's the promise. That's the possibility. Of course, not every urban disaster creates such outpourings of genius. Right? New Orleans is still recovering from the Katrina disaster that was, in fact, quite poorly handled. Um, the part of the, the, one of the facts we know about disaster relief is that it tends to illustrate the quality of government. And across the U.S., there's a massive difference in the quality of government between some states and other states. Louisiana typically ranks in the bottom, using things like corruption indices to measure the competence of local government. The combination of uh, local and, and national mismanagement created a national tragedy. Now, there are upsides of it, right? Which is the children who are forced to leave New Orleans because of Katrina, typically end up getting much better educations elsewhere. So in fact, this type of urban disaster is not always a, a, you know, a, a full of downsides, but let us not hope that that is what we say about Christchurch in 10 years. <laughs> got better education. So um, rebuilding does, you know, that there are cases, and I think the real thing to think about the ability of cities to come back is that when cities retain their human capital, when they retain their talent pool, they're typically able to rebuild. So the work of, say, for example, Davis and Weinstein, which compares those Japanese cities that were bombed more heavily by U.S. bombers during World War II with those cities that were not, found almost a complete comeback of the cities that experienced more damage, in part because the human talent tended to stay or come back or remain rooted in those places. Once the human talent leaves, then the area is in far more danger. And indeed, the sort of U.S. history, and remember, the U.S. may not have examples like Christchurch of the, of the destruction of an earthquake, but the U.S. is filled, as we'll discuss later, with cities that are shadows of their former self. Detroit, for example, most notably, right? Those cities are so troubled, in part because it's the human capital that left. The physical capital is still there. Those structures, unlike the structures in downtown Christchurch, those structures by and large stand. It's just, it's the humanity that is ultimately the real heart of the city that is missing. And that's what makes it so hard to come back. 
Now, I want to, in terms of discussing this and discussing what cities need to get right, I want to take you on a bit of a tour of urban growth and decline in the, U in the US and elsewhere over the past maybe two centuries. And I want to start with a portrait of America. And I, I call it a portrait to make it clear from the start that I have absolutely no aesthetic sense whatsoever. Uh, to make that really clear to be those people with some architectural bent, but it is sort of a picture. What I've done is I've taken the 3,000 odd counties in the US and I've split them into tens. Each one of those dots represents 300 counties. Okay, a tenth of America. And what I've done is I've ranked them, I've grouped them on the basis of their density levels, people per square, uh, square mile. Because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. What the bottom line shows is the relationship between density and median family incomes. This is the tendency of people who live in big cities to end up being richer than people who live outside of cities. It's not universal, but it is, tends to be a fairly strong pattern. What you see in the graph is the richest tenth of America's counties have incomes that are on average 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. So the most dense tenth, 50% richer than the least dense half. This is a general phenomenon called agglomeration economies. The, the advantages of being surrounded by economic activities. It's an issue that New Zealand actually faces, being a relatively small country that's, dis, that it's in a distant part of the world. The ability to exploit these agglomeration economies is limited. And they show up in facts like the fact that the three largest metropolitan areas in the US produce 18% of America's GDP, while including only 13% of America's population. Now, the, bottom, the top line shows something that's perhaps something somewhat more surprising which is the relationship between initial population density and population growth. So what you see is the places that have the fastest population growth in the US are the places that started with the least land per capita. Whereas the Americans at the start of the 20th century left their Dunsang players on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans. At the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. Now, this is uh, another measure of urban success, which is the relationship between housing price growth between 1996 and 2012 and initial housing density. America has just experienced a vast tsunami of housing price increases and decreases. But through all that, there's been a prevailing pattern of prices to rise in the urban core, in dense, in dense areas. And of course, those rising housing prices are partially a reflection of people's willingness to pay to be close to other people. Of course, we also see these are incomes across uh, areas in, in New Zealand. We also see, of course, the high levels of income in Auckland, Wellington, uh, followed by Canterbury down there. But the, the significant urbanization exists here as well. Now, whatever is going on in the success of dense urban areas in the developed world is nothing relative to what's happening in the developing world. Right? This incredible urbanization of India and China and Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, Gandhi famously said the future of the nation lies not in its villages, but not in its cities, but in its villages. But with all due respect to the great man on this one, he was completely and totally wrong. Right? <laughs> the future of India is not in its villages, which remain mired in the same rural poverty and deprivation that has marked India's past. Right? It is in cities, it is in Bangalore, it is in Mumbai, it is in Kolkata, it is in Gargan, it is in Delhi, that India is transforming itself, that is moving out of poverty into prosperity. Cities are providing the conduits across civilizations that have you know, enabled India to change, to grow, to become more prosperous. Um, this is the relationship between density and earnings in the US, and India, and China. This is the US, and you can see that actually this is Everything's normalized, but the least dense areas have one. And so the U.S. is roughly 23% wealthier in those dense areas relative to the least dense areas. The numbers for India and China are significantly higher, over 35%. I apologize, this should have made India, of course, saffron and China blue, but I got the color. I got the color wrong. But the urbanization advantage is higher in the developing world than it is in the developed world. We recently passed this fairly remarkable halfway point where more than 50% of humanity now lives in cities. And it's hard not to think that on net that's a very good thing. Because when you compare those cities, those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have incomes that are on average five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. Now it's easy to look at the slums, the favelas, the disadvantaged areas of our cities, of these cities, and say to you to ourselves, boy, this is an unparalleled disaster. That we would be much better off if these poor people just lived in these rural areas. But anyone who believes that has actually never been to rural India or the rural northeast of Brazil. 
Because in fact, when you look at the hard statistics comparing the, the lives in these rural areas with the lives even in a favela in Rio, there's no comparison. These people who choose to come from rural, from rural Brazil to, to the favelas of Rio are not fools. They're not ignorant. They're doing something entirely reasonable. They're getting opportunity, they're getting a social safety net, they're getting the ability to get around and find a future. And that shows up in any form of statistics that you look at. The problem is that Westerners go to these cities and they see something that's far worse than anything they could imagine for their own lives. But they don't similarly spend time in the areas of rural deprivation. In some sense, one way to think about this is that cities should never apologize for their poverty. Because cities don't typically make people poor, they attract poor people with the promise of economic opportunity, with the possibility of change. And that's why favelas actually have plenty to recommend themselves. Among those who see the, these urban areas and think about their distress, there is a view that says that even if they are wealthy, even if they have less infant mortality, even if they have you know, other measures of wealthy, we're losing the joys of rural living, right? Anyone, anyone raised on Wordsworth can believe in that, right? Uh, <laughs> although it's not much about rural India that, that reminds you of, of you know, a Wordsworth <laughs> poem. But uh, you would think, for example, that perhaps we've lost the happiness, the joys that come with rural life, right? The joys which come with, you know, the very real pleasures of being, uh, you know, being on the Canterbury Plain outside of, outside of uh, Christchurch. I mean, these are pleasant rural areas. But in fact, when you compare it, when you look across the world, there's a very strong positive relationship between self-reported life satisfaction, happiness, and urbanization. So the more urbanized countries, which is what you see here, have more than 70% of their population saying that they're satisfied with their lives. By contrast, less than 50% of the population in the most rural countries say that they're, they're satisfied with their lives. A very dramatic difference. You know, within countries, there's no, in the wealthy world, people who live in cities don't typically say that they're happier than people who live outside cities. You know, speaking as a, as a New Yorker, I know no self-respecting New Yorker is going to tell some surveyor how happy they are for their lives. <laughs> right? By contrast, however, respondents in the developing world are very clearly saying, the ones who live in cities say that they're much more satisfied with their lives than people who live outside them. Now, in some sense, this strength of urban areas is a bit of a paradox. We live in an age in which distance is allegedly dead, in which we could all telecommute in from whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia. We could all, you know, live, live outside of Queenstown in some magnificent spot and gaze at the lakes and the mountains all day long. That would be wonderful on one level. On the other hand, we don't choose to do it, right? Over and over again in countries throughout the world, right, we choose the inconveniences, the, the discomfort of urban life, the high cost of urban living despite the fact that the cyber seers and the techno prophets told us we'd all be inhabiting electronic villages and just dialing in, dialing it in. Why is that? Why is it that these technologies have not made cities obsolete, have not made the face-to-face -face contact that really is the whole reason for being in urban areas, why is it that they haven't made that totally irrelevant in our world, in a world where we just you know, do everything here? Um, now, this relative and rosy view of cities, I'll come back to that paradox later, is very different from the New York City of my youth. Um, these are two iconic images from New York. I was born in Manhattan in 1967. And those were years in which the age of the city appeared to have come and gone. Not just New York or Chicago or Boston or Seattle or San Francisco, but London. Paris always is maintained by the, the, the strong hand of the French government, which will make sure that it's all right. But, you know, <coughs> elsewhere, in, in areas where the government isn't going to, wasn't going to prop up the city, it really seemed as if the age of the, age of the city had gone. Um, New York had hemorrhaged garment sector jobs, uh, hundreds of thousands of industrial jobs lost in a few short years, as, industrializ as deindustrialization worked its magic in, in these areas. There had been spiraling social distress, crime rates that were out of control, a fiscal situation that was utterly unmanageable. President Ford didn't literally tell New York to drop dead, uh, but lots of people think he actually meant it in his heart of hearts, um, because the city was asking for money, it was asking for a bailout after having mismanaged its own finances terribly. Um, and it really seemed possible in those ages, in that age, that New York was going to be reclaimed by the weeds. And the top image you see is President Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, when it really seemed possible, as if the trees would come out and reclaim the buildings, and someday the Statue of Liberty would come poking out of the sand like at the end of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> uh, that thing seemed that dire. Of course, riots were burning down our cities. This is the Detroit's 1967 riot. The cities that gave us civilization, 
had been burned down by their own, their own residents. And rebuilding these areas was a challenge of an earlier era. Right? It's one thing at the earthquake levels you city. These are your own citizens that are burning it, that are burning it down. And we experienced this most recently in, in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the reasons why the future of cities in the 1970s seems so dire is that the original reason for being of these urban areas had largely disappeared. So if you think about what the older, colder cities of the US and mostly of Europe were, in, were meant to do, they were part of a transportation network. There were nodes on a great tool for moving goods across space. So if you go back to 1816, Americans stood on the edge of an enormously wealthy continent that was virtually inaccessible. Right? It cost as much to move goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean in 1816. And so over the 19th century, Americans built this incredible transportation network, first canals and then railroads, and cities sprung up on pitch points along that network, right? The points where goods needed to move from one form of transportation, lifted by the early de elevators of Joseph Dart and Buffalo, from the ships that plied the Great Lakes to the canal going boats that moved things along the Erie Canal. And industries came up around those pinch points. And every one of the 20, old, 20 largest cities in the U.S. in 1900 was on a major waterway. The oldest, typically where the river meets the sea, like Boston and New York, were the newest. Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River. Chicago, of course, the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans, made possible by two canals, Erie and Illinois and Michigan. And of course, the industry sprung up around those, those transportation nodes, just to give a sort of sense of how that magic occurred. Think about New York's dominant industries during the 19th century. Sugar refining, there because of the huge amount of trade that New York did with the Caribbean, and because you couldn't refine sugar down in the tropics in the 19th century because those crystals would coalesce during the long hot sea voyage north and need to be re-refined. Mm -hmm. Printing and publishing. In New York, it was the big money in 19th century printing and publishing was in pirated English novels. Right? No Asian property rights think I anything on our boys in the 1820s who would excel in stealing anything that Sir Walter Scott or Charles Dickens pr produced by his pen. Now the thing is, the thing is, if you're publishing pirated novels, you kind of need to publish first. Because there's no percentage in having the eighth pirated edition of Girls with a Dragon Tattoo in town. What, what are you going to get from that? Now if you're going to be first, then being in the port is really valuable. Because the great New York publishers, the Harper Brothers, would get the latest Walter Scott novel, would get Carol and Pete, days before it even showed up in the hands of their Philadelphia competitors carrying a lead. That access to that port enabled them to flood the market before indeed anything, before Carrie and Lee were able to publish. That port made it possible for New York to become a printing and publishing hub. Now, of course, Chicago's great industry, number one by value added, number two by employment, was its stockyards. Now, stockyards are part of a transportation problem. America, then, as now, well, also true of the Canterbury Plain, right, is great at growing wheat, is great at growing corn in particular, right? Even without America's utterly benighted policy of agricultural subsidies, we would be good at doing this. Right? I'm sorry, that was a completely unnecessary editorial. <laughs> uh, even without, though, these utterly benighted policies, we would be good at this. Now, but the problem, of course, with corn is it's a low value per ton product, and hence relatively costly to ship. Uh, it also rots if not properly handled. So it needs to be transformed into a portable pro product. In the early days, that transformation transformed corn or wheat into whiskey. Uh, Portable, durable, often quite tasty, uh, <laughs> a good product for shipping from western Pennsylvania onward. Then furthermore, then a little bit later, the corn was transformed into salted pigs. Pigs are, of course, corn with feet. Uh, and this was the product of Porcopolis, Cincinnati, the great 19th century, early 19th century city that specialized in transforming the wheat of the Ohio River uh, Valley into, uh, into pigs, which were then salted and shipped east. Chicago then replaced them when the transportation technology made it possible to access the great corn-growing regions of Iowa and Illinois. And during those years, a new transportation innovation associated with this character, armor, refrigerated rail cars that enabled them to ship frozen, dressed beef uh, instead of salted pork. Because for some reason or other, humanity has always preferred its beef relatively fresh and its pork more likely to be salted. No reckoning for taste. But, uh, the, the, those, and the great armor innovation is refrigerated rail cars. And the great idea is you put the blocks of ice on top of the beef instead of below it. 
So cold water drips down, keeping the beef, keeping the beef cold. Um, and so the city comes up around the, around the transportation networks. Now I've already mentioned, and this is sort of the critical aspect of cities, even when they form for these utterly prosaic reasons, even when they form as part of solving an operations research problem, miracles happen when smart people connect with one another and learn from one another and steal each other as ideas. Because it's in the wake of this, in the wake of the great Chicago fire, that the miracles occur that create, that give us the skyscraper. Those echo the earlier wonders that happened in Athens 25 centuries ago, or in 15th century Florence, right? A city of woolen banking, right? Where a chain of genius figures out how to make the Renaissance happen, right? So think particularly about the pictorial Renaissance that starts with Brunelleschi's ability to figure out the mathematics of linear perspective, making two-dimensional images appear three-dimensional. He passes them along to his close friend and traveling companion, Donatello, who puts it on a low-relief sculpture in the wall of Orson Michele, right below that statue of St. George. Passes it along to Masaccio, who puts it on the wall of Brancacci Chapel, that marvelous picture of the saint, Peter finding a silver coin in the belly of a fish. Passes it along to that very less than saintly monk, Fra Filippo Lippi. Passes it along to Botticelli and so forth. A chain of genius, all connected by the city, all knowing each other, all stealing each other's ideas and expanding them. This is what cities do that matters. And so it was in Detroit, another inland port, right? Another place which had, you know, great cutting edge companies specializing in supplying ships that plied the Great Lakes. This is an image of Detroit Dry Dock, right? And Detroit Dry Dock employed this character, young farm boy, came to Detroit, Henry Ford, learned engines working in Detroit Dry Dock. Cities then, as now, are forges of human capital. One of the things you learn when looking at wage data of cities, it's not as if people who come to cities immediately see their wages skyrocket. What happens is their wage gains go up. Year by year, month by month, they earn slightly more because they're surrounded by the maelstrom of economic activity and are able to learn from it, just as Henry Ford was able to learn about engines by working in Detroit. He then goes to work for Thomas Edison, becomes an entrepreneur and innovator and enjoys the great 19th century game of trying to figure out how to make cars cheaper. Contrary to what many American politicians routinely state, Americans, of course, did not invent the car. Right? <laughs> I know that may not be news to you here, but I always have to tell American audiences of this, and it always disappoints them so much. <laughs> it's told them so often. Uh, but we did actually play ahead and make it cheaper. And this is not something that Kenny Ford came up with it on his own, because he was part of a cluster of genius, much like Silicon Valley in the 1890s. Lots of small, nimble uh, entrepreneurs. Ford, the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar, Billy Durant, Ransom the Olds, right, all of the greater Detroit area. The first person to build a car in Detroit was a guy called Charles Kirby. And according to legend, Ford followed Kirby's car as it drove down Detroit pedaling furiously on his bicycle, trying to figure out how this car worked. Now, I think this story is almost surely apocryphal, but nonetheless, I love it. Because it, sort of, it sort of provides this image of the city as educator, as providing this opportunity for Ford to, to borrow Kirby's idea and improve upon it, as indeed he did. Now, on one level, Ford's great invention, you know, a massive you know, assembly line, automated, producing, you know, cars unbelievably cheaply as long as they were black, employing, you know, employees at five dollar days. Unbelievable achievement, right? Static productivity gains are tremendous. Providing mobility for ordinary Americans, ordinary people throughout the world, doing it on the cheap, providing employment for thousands of people. Great stuff in the short run. Possibly making Detroit the most productive place on the planet by 1950. But in the long run, Ford's model was a disaster for urban, urban regeneration. Successful cities in the 19th century were marked by three things. Smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world. This was Birmingham in the age of Matthew Bolton, or New York in the age of Alexander Hamilton. These three things, smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world, are still the linchpin of urban success today. Right? Think about how far from that is the River Rouge, Ford's vast, vertically integrated factory. An empire unto itself, walled off from the outside world, employing tens of thousands of less well-educated workers. Incredibly productive, but not part of the fabric of the city. Not a generator of new entrepreneurs or new innovations. Does not need the urban area that surrounds it, does not give to it, and follows its own logic, and that logic is cost minimization. And when the price of transportation declines, and this is the 90% decline of the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail over the 20th century, when the price of transportation declines, making those erstwhile advantages of being on the Great Lakes, of being next to the various inputs, the steel, the uh, the iron ore, I mean, the, the wood that, that were part of making those cars, 
that proximity became irrelevant over the course of the 20th century's transportation costs tumbled. And so factories moved to lower cost locales. They moved to suburbs. They moved to right-to-work states that were more pro-business and less pro-union. The work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota compares those counties that are on different borders of state lines and shows the extraordinary difference in the amount of manufacturing growth in the pro-business states relative to the pro-labor states. And then finally, of course, moved to low-cost locales elsewhere. Right? This is what declining transportation costs, this is what the depth of distance made possible. One way of seeing this is that 19th century cities were defined on the basis of production advantages. Pittsburgh, defined by access to its coal mines, for example. 21st century cities are far more likely to be consumer cities because businesses are fundamentally mobile and people want to live in various areas. Think about Los Angeles from this retirement place for prosperous Midwestern farmers a century ago being in some sort of proto uh, consumer city. What we've learned from this depth of distance and the rise of the consumer city is the one thing American consumers were really hoping for was for warmer Januaries. Because there's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth during the 20th century than January temperature. Um, this is the last 10, 10 years. One is the coldest places, five is the warmest places. Now, there are many things ruled up in that. Those warmer places tend to have more pro-business policies. They tend to be places that have relatively pro-housing policies that make it relatively easy to build. Um, but they also are places that have warmer Januaries. And as, as a resident of Boston, I am keenly aware that that is not entirely relevant. Along with the move to sun was the move to sprawl. We have always built our urban areas around the transportation technology that is dominant in the era in which they are being created. Our oldest urban spaces are built at a pedestrian scale. Short blocks, narrow streets, <coughs> thoroughfares often wide in the way that a person will wind when walking, or that someone will wind when, carrying, when moving their goats along. Think about the oldest areas of, of European cities, or even the oldest areas of New York or Boston, right? classic pedestrian areas. And then we move to the area of wheeled transport, typically pulled by a, a horse, a horse-drawn omnibus, for example. Um, these areas require areas that are gridded. So you have some larger blocks, more space for the roads, straight roads, longer blocks, and then of course you move to the areas that were made possible by streetcars, tramways. That's much of the feeling of Christchurch, right? Most of Christchurch is a, is a tramway city. It's a city now consumed by the car, of course, but it's a city that was laid out in terms of the, the heart of the area, very much around the sort of sprawl of the late 19th, early 20th century, which is a streetcar-oriented kind of sprawl. And then of course you move to the car, right? On one level, the car is just the latest continuation of sprawl, but on another level, it's different. Because all of these older forms of sprawl were fundamentally hub and spoke, meaning you walked from where the streetcar dropped you off. So development needed to be somewhat compact. The car is different, it is point to point, and it both enables and requires vast amounts of space to accommodate itself. Right? It's not the car is bad, and you know, I commute to work myself, and it's, we understand why people drive. The average commute by in the US by public transit is 48 commutes, the average commute by car is 24 minutes. But cars do require management, and they should not be subsidized. Right? So it it's, should be a choice that people make, internalizing fully the social cost of their action, whether those costs are pollution or, or congestion as well. Hit by the move to sun and sprawl, this is what happened to the 10 largest American cities as of 1950. Eight of them have lost more than 20% of their population between 1950 and 2010. Three of them lost more than 50% of their population. Right? So America has had urban disasters on a truly grand scale, and none more so than Detroit. And I believe there's a major lesson in Detroit that is worthwhile paying attention to. Um, America tragically followed a Potemkin village strategy of urban renewal starting after World War II. And I say that because it is a strategy that emphasized physical structures over the real human needs of the population. In the 50s and 60s, it emphasized large-scale urban renewal structures put up with the help of federal dollars. After the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973, it focused on transportation infrastructure. Right? This was part of an unholy alliance with highway builders and urban politicians that actually got subsidies for highways at the, at the, by getting subsidies for mass transit. Now, there are many good things about various forms of mass transit, but this thing is not one of them. <laughs> okay? The hallmark of declining cities 
in really declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of people, relative to the level of demand. Detroit was built for 1.85 million people. It is less than half of it. It does not need subsidized housing. More than 90% of the homes in Central City of Detroit cost far less than the physical cost of construction, right? Far less than $600 a square meter to buy one of these houses, right? Um, and of course, it is easy to get around downtown Detroit, right? The streets are empty. You don't need a monorail to glide over essentially empty streets in this area, right? And yet, you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars on transportation infrastructure, right? Because of this protecting village strategy. It is incredibly easy because politicians, certainly the ones in the US, are beloved of cutting ribbons on large scale projects. Because you can take a shiny building and declare, well, look, Cleveland is back. We have this skyscraper downtown. Well, Cleveland isn't back, and it didn't need the bloody skyscraper to begin with. Okay? It has a lot of space. But it's very easy to actually cut a ribbon on a shiny piece of infrastructure and declare that you've achieved something good, even if this, if this has nothing to do with what the city actually needs. Now, that is not to say that cities don't need infrastructure. Right? Growing cities of the, of the world do tend to need infrastructure. If, we, if I were giving this talk in, you know, in Mumbai, I would be very much talking about the need to deliver infrastructure that actually works for the, cities, for the citizens of India's cities. So it is not that infrastructure is necessarily always right or wrong. There are times where infrastructure is absolutely necessary. But it pays to be smart because it's possible to make incredible mistakes in this area, as certainly American cities can. Now, if you compare which cities have come back, which cities, which cities have not, they customarily have not been driven by infrastructure. There's something else that has made the difference. Because it's so easy today to forget how universal the sense of urban decline was in the 1970s. In 1971, two jokers put up a sign, a billboard on the highway leading Seattle, asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Because Boeing, mighty Boeing, had been cutting down on its number of jobs, and just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, nobody could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. This is before Amazon, before Microsoft, before Costco, and Starbucks is the faint whiff of a, a short black aroma in a, in a coffee roaster's nostrils, right? But Starbucks did come back, and it came back not because of any large-scale project, not because of a massive infrastructure investment, certainly not because of a monorail. It came back because of smart people who were entrepreneurial, who provide the ultimate source of urban regeneration. It's ultimately not about what's done in terms of the government enterprises, in terms of creating urban regeneration. It's ultimately about guys like these, you know, the guys in, in, in Seattle who created the jobs and new ideas and export industries that enabled that city to come back. New York's regeneration, right? New York's great, great wealth is based on one particular industry, right? which is, by the way, not a good model. That's a model that weeps in Detroit, doesn't it? Um, but it is one industry. It's finance. 42% of the payroll in the island of Manhattan is in finance and insurance, right? A massive industrial cluster. Now, on one level, there's something that's you know, not particularly surprising about that. If you believe that the ultimate source of urban success today is the ability to transfer ideas and make people smart, then there's no industry in which being a little bit smarter can be turned into a fortune more quickly than in finance, right? Which is why financial firms tend to be most willing to put up with the cost and inconvenience of living in cities. There's another part of the New York story, though, which is about a chain of innovation in finance, starting with a more sophisticated ability to trade off risk and return, which actually comes from the academy, comes from the social science building at the University of Chicago, and gets transferred by people like Harry Markowitz to more business, more applied areas. This then gets carried by people like Fisher Black, to, to Wall Street. That ability to think about risk and return and then, gets, get, then gets used by the young Michael Milken to sell high yield debt junk bonds, if you will, right, to investors by convincing them the risks are outweighed by the return. Those high yield debts then enable the young Henry Kravis to engage in larger and larger levered buyouts, getting value out of underperforming American companies like RJR and Nabisco. Right? The securitization revolution created by Lou Ranieri is part of this, and so is, is Michael Bloomberg's term on this. Now, he's part of this chain of, of innovation, kind of like the chain of innovation that gave us Renaissance art, uh, but he's also, um, he's also interesting for two other reasons, one of which is that Jay Jacobs in The Economy of City was very insistent on the urban power to facilitate leaps of innovation from one industry to another. She used a story about how the brassiere was invented, um, 
which I think is proven to be somewhat apocryphal as, as well. Uh, but the idea of coming from the dress industry rather than from the, from the lingerie industry. But Bloomberg is another example of cross-industry fertilization because, of course, Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire, right? He's an IT billionaire. He's in some sense competing with the guys in Silicon Valley, at least when he's not competing with Rupert Murdoch. Um, and his success, though, shows the ability of cities to create those cross-industry leaps. The reason why he's able to succeed in information technology like a Silicon Valley guy is because he's run the technology operation of Solomon Brothers, having run their, their trading floor beforehand. He actually knows what the traders want. He has the information that the city has given him right, in a way that no Silicon Valley entrepreneur could possibly know because they hadn't done that. But there's a third reason why I like to put this picture on, because of the physical layout. It's the bullpen at City Hall, which is based on the bullpen at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Now, when you think about it, there's something funny about trading floors. Here are some of the wealthiest people on the planet who, in any normal industry, like academia, would sit behind vast open doors, protected in large offices with numerous assistants, keeping out all the inconveniences of life. Right? But here they are, some of the wealthiest people on the planet, foregoing all the perquisites of privacy that their wealth has made possible for them, putting up with the inconveniences of being next to each other. And there they are, they're sweating on each other, they're getting guacamole on each other, they're <laughs> spitting on each other, right? The whole thing is inconvenient. Why are they there? Why are they willing to put up with that? Because knowledge is so important in this industry, because they need to know what's going on. Because insight is more important than space. And that, in a sense, is why the city came back. Because knowledge is more important than space. And that's one way of understanding the riddle with which I started this, of why it is the changes in globalization and technology has made cities more, not less important. Because what these changes have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've increased the returns to innovation. We have literally hundreds of studies showing the, showing the rise in returns to skill that follow along the time of globalization and new technologies. Because you can now make it on the other side of the planet, because you can source it on the other side of the planet. <coughs> If being smart is more important, then cities are more important because we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. It is how we learn. We come out of the womb with this remarkable talent from soaking up information from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, and occasionally from our teachers. This is how cities work. This is how universities work. And the more complicated the world is, the more complicated ideas are, the more important it is to communicate those ideas face to face. Anybody who has ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your script. It's not knowing what it is that you're supposed to come in and communicate. It's knowing whether or not anything you're teaching is getting through. Right? And we have evolved over millions of years to have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room. This is why face-to-face -face contact is so important. This is why a more complex, idea-rich, innovative world makes face-to-face -face contact more important. And this is why these technologies are making cities more important, not less important. It is also why Education is such a linchpin of urban success that indeed it is the idea-intensive cities, the Seattle's, the Boston's, the New York's, the, that are able to, to, to thrive in this world. The areas that are short on education, that are short on human capital, have not been able to regenerate themselves. If you want to understand why Buffalo looks different from Boston, both are doing exactly as well as the share of the population with the college degree of those places in 1970 predicts that they should do. What I've done here is I've taken counties in the U.S., and I've ranked them on the basis of the share of the population of the college degree in the year 2000, and this is subsequent population growth. As you can see, all of the fast growth has been in the more educated counties of the U.S. These educated places are declining. This is the relationship between per capita GDP and the share of adults with college degrees in the year 2000. This is not just the ordinary tendency of people who are more educated to earn more. Because, in fact, having educated neighbors is very, very valuable. Holding your years of schooling constant, as the share of adults with a college degree in your metropolitan area goes up by 10%, your wages go up on average by 8% in the United States. And this finding has been Dr. Noah, and in fact, is much stronger outside the U.S. Of course, there's also a very strong correlation between skills and per capita earnings across countries. And indeed, this is part of you know, New Zealand's success. This is a very skilled country, and one that America actually has something to learn from in terms of the quality of our public education system. This is, the, um, this is a useful thing. This is from Hanischek, Peterson, Grossman. This is the share of students at advanced levels in math uh, using PISA scores. Um, this is the US average. This is about 6%. Here's New Zealand, right? Between Netherlands and uh, Liechtenstein and the Czech Republic, a little bit better than Japan, right? So a massive gulf. This is something that is enormously important. There's also a reason why, in fact, when you look at Christchurch, 
you don't necessarily think an agrarian metropolis in the center of America. It's one of the things that makes Christchurch different is its skills. And those skills make the possibility of urban rebuilding, of dense rebuilding the center far more plausible than it is in, in many of the less skilled areas of the US. Those, these are highlighted American states that are very proud of their level of achievement. So Massachusetts, my home state, being one of them. Notice we're still way behind New Zealand. Okay, enough of making you feel good about yourself right now. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, growth rates are good too. Now, well, um, the formal skills that are talked about are clearly important for urban success. Surely the most important things that matter for urban, urban resilience are the skills that are learned not in the classroom, but on the streets, in the firms, at, at home, and elsewhere. And that's, after all, what we're talking about, right? That's, that's what we're talking about, cities doing their important. This idea that Alfred Marshall, the great English economist, talked about 120 years ago, when he wrote that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Well, those mysteries that are perhaps most important are those that are related to the inclination and talent to be an entrepreneur. Because as we talked about in the case of Seattle, it is those entrepreneurs who are the ultimate linchpin of urban success. You know, 16 years ago, the economist Ben Chinnitz was comparing New York to Pittsburgh, and noticing that New York appeared to be more resilient than Pittsburgh did even then. He argued that this was a result of a culture of entrepreneurship inculcated by New York's industrial past. New York's greatest industry, greater than sugar refining, greater than printing and publishing, also a child of the port, was garment production. Right? Garment production was a mother of entrepreneurship because the returns to scale were so limited, because anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. By contrast, Pittsburgh had U.S. Steel, right? a vast vertically integrated company that needed company men, not entrepreneurs. Right? The result of this was that when U.S. Steel did not thrive, right, those company men had no idea what else to do because they were comms and a very efficient corporate machine, but they weren't going to start an electronic greeting card company if U.S. Steel faltered. But these guys, these guys were always coming up with something new, right? That's the nature of being an entrepreneur. They were trying to find an, oppor an, an, an opportunity. And the history of, of you know, U.S. industry is replete with people who got started in the garment industry and then went did something else, started a Hollywood studio, right? Built more skyscrapers than anyone else did in New York City. These people came out of garments and then did something, did something else. And they were also crucial in terms of the redefinition of the city after its decline. Now, it's remarkable given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurship are, how powerful they are in predicting the resilience across areas. One measure is average establishment size. Having lots of little firms is seen as being entrepreneurial, having a few big firms is seen as not being so. This is employment growth in the places with big firms. This is employment growth in the places with little firms. Huge differences, and this is true in any way that we know it, controlling for any number of things within cities as well as across cities. Big firms, small growth, small firms, big growth. Doesn't mean that big firms can be extraordinarily productive in the short run, but the long run resilience appears to be associated with small firms. This is another way of measuring it, taking the initial time period, the short share of employment in new establishments relative to old establishments. Again, new establishments, fast growth, old, old establishments, not fast growth. There is a question about what government does to make entrepreneurs. This is again where I make you feel good about yourself. Um, there are, you know, the, the litany of government attempts to subsidize entrepreneurship through making loans to entrepreneurs. Now, every entrepreneur will claim that, you know, we've got such a problem here, the venture capitalists are short-sighted. You know, that's, it's a market failure, the venture capitalists are short-sighted. That just means they don't see the possible gain in funding them, right? That's, and, you know, and, you know, I listen to their idea, I don't think those venture capitalists are crazy either most of the time. Um, <laughs> but, and the litany, as discussed by Josh Lerner in his wonderful book, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, is government attempts to, to get involved in this, uh, the Libya failures are enormous, right? For every one success, there are tons of failures. There's perhaps slightly more upside to cluster strategies. Uh, Silicon Valley itself had some role, had some roots in, in certain government policies, although much more so the entrepreneurship of, um, of Stanford's uh, Fred Terman. Um, Boston is currently engaged in an education district, an innovation district that may bear some fruit, but again, it's a risky strategy. But again, when you think about sort of innovation and entrepreneurship, it does sort of seem to be something that you should be thinking about in terms of rebuilding central price, right? in terms of small firms uh, and nimble startups. Um, educational spillover is clearly important. Uh, there's been tremendous entrepreneurship around educational establishments when the US government changed the policies that made it possible to patent research that had been funded with government grants. And finally, of course, the low-hanging fruit is eliminating barriers to entry, making it easier to start. According to the World Bank's Doing Business Report, the number one country in the world in terms of the ease of starting a new business is, of course, New Zealand, but then again, you knew that. Um, okay, now that being said, that being said, the most entrepreneurial place on the planet that I've ever been is not New York, and it is not Christchurch, it is the Durangi slum of Mumbai. 
right, where I wandered through Dharavi and you were just struck by the enormous promise of Indian human capital. You know, you look in one corner and there are a couple of guys who are recycling boxes, and that means chopping them open and turning them inside out and stapling them up again so you can't see the old labels, that's recycling. And then you go a little bit further down, a couple of guys who are sewing, uh, you know, sewing dresses, they're sewing brassiers, and you think you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1906. And then a little bit further down, there's a ceramic station, and they're making little pots. And they're so proud of these pots, they give you one, they won't even take any money for it. And then a little bit further on, there's a, there's a, a, a series of women who are, who are involved in recycling plastics. And you just feel wonder at the talent that was created by this area, that was connected by this area, that saw the potential uh, for new businesses created by the city. And then you walk outside in the street, and there's a kid who's defecating on an unpaved road. And you know the water isn't safe, and the electricity is at best intermittent. And it reminds you that there are tremendous demons that also dwell in density. Right? That if two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give each other a contagious disease. And if someone's close enough to give you a pretty little pocket, they're also close enough to pick your pocket. Um, and it reminds you also that cities have been dealing with the downsides of density for 3,000 years. And that cities need healthy, effective public sectors to manage these potential risks. Right? So much of the story about entrepreneurship that I've told is not one in which the public sector plays a major role. But this does not mean that the public sector is not crucial for the functioning of, of cities. But in fact, you know, in some sense, there's a good reason why people who live in rural Montana like government a lot less than people who live in New York do. They need government much less. And in some sense, also, the failures of government are made obvious when people cram together in urban areas, as is true in many of the urban areas of, of India. Um, now, the demons that come with density, some of them are relatively old standing and have long been solved in, in the developed world. Contagious disease and clean water, traffic, congestion, crime, and corruption, the high cost of living and poverty. This is the path rate of the uh, death rates, mortality rates in New York over the past 200 years. A boy born in New York in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. That was somewhat similar to the life expectancy gap in Tudor London as well. About seven, year, seven years of life is giving up to get, get the wonders of living in the city. That gap has disappeared. In fact, life expectancy is about three years longer in New York than elsewhere. No one understands, by the way, why death rates are lower among elderly people living in urban areas. Some people credit walking, other people credit urban connection. It's very easy, though, to understand why mortality rates are lower among the young. Two big reasons, two causes of death are accidents, most of motor vehicle accidents, and suicides in the US, both of which are much rarer among young people living in urban areas. Um, Motor vehicle license is quite obvious. It's just a lot safer to get behind, you know, get get in a in a bus after having a few drinks than having a couple of, than getting behind the wheel of a car. Motor vehicle license suicide is much odder. Right? It's true, and I don't know the extent to which this is true elsewhere. In the U.S., the peak areas for suicide tend to be very low density areas with a lot of prevalence of guns on a per capita basis. Um, now, uh, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, the the point being that clean water actually didn't happen easily that America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the army and the post office. These investments still need to be made by the developing world. Water admitted an engineering solution. Congestion does not. You cannot build your way out of traffic congestion because of the behavioral response. There's something which has been identified by Gilles Durant and Matthew Turner called the fundamental law of traffic congestion, which is that vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive. <coughs> that means that you're not going to get uncongested roads by just building more. In some sense, you can't ever get proper use of a scarce resource, and streets are a scarce resource, by giving it away for free. This is basically how the Soviet Union tried to ration groceries during the, during the bad old days, right? Eggs and butter were pennies on the dollar, and the result was you couldn't get any eggs and butter, right? There were long lines and stock outs of Soviet, and Soviet groceries. This is what we do with our city streets. We give away valuable access to city streets for free, and the result is the urban equivalent of long lines and stock outs, which are traffic towns, which are wasting far too much time. The only way to actually handle this is with things like congestion pricing. Right? Singapore, second densest country in the world, streets move fluidly during peak times because they charge people for driving. They charge people for the congestion that they create, the social cost of the, of the time that, they, that you're wasting every time you go on the streets by imposing on other drivers. No other way to conceivably handle this, handle this problem in terms, of, in terms of getting to a good answer. Um, of course, this needs to be accompanied by decent public transit. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it's, it's a long-standing claim that 40 years of wisdom in transportation and economics can, and Harvard can be boiled down four words, bus good, train bad. Okay, uh, enough of that. Uh, this is, of course, an old image. But, of course, cities, when they work well, can be places of tremendous pleasure as well as productivity. 
the same urban entrepreneurship that makes for good urban software companies, makes for great urban restaurants, the ability to share spaces right, makes cities enormously exciting. You know, it's, it's often, you go, just go back to this, this is a, an image of, of Zipcar, right? Uh, Zipcar is a technology which enables people, typically, you know, younger people, to uh, own part of a car. It's really sort of an hourly rental system. And it works for a combination of GPS systems and credit cards, and you can take it out for as much as, as you want. It's tremendously popular among, among kids. This, of course, is a handmaiden of technology. Because, look, if you try to run a car-sharing business in Manhattan in 1973, you know, Robert De Niro would have shot someone in the back of the car, right? <laughs> they, uh, not literally Robert De Niro. I don't actually mean any slanders while I'm on tape, obviously. I'm played by Robert De Niro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, forget that I mentioned Robert De Niro. I, I, uh, forget that I mentioned film. Uh, this is a car. It's a technology for sharing cars. Um, okay. The, um, the, the, the point is that the Zipcar spiel involves a whole lot of the sharing economy, that we're all about sharing. There's nothing new about sharing economies to cities. What is a restaurant, a great urban invention coming out of Paris in the 18th century, other than a shared kitchen and a shared dining room? What is a park other than shared green space, right? This is what you know, cities have long done. And when you think about you know, these urban spaces, and you think about what we hope for, I presume you hope for it in Central Chrysler. It's about the, the shared spaces as well that also make for that also make for magic. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. But the, well, I'm not. I'm going to say something about it. Another issue that is that is important is the provision of, of is dealing with affordability. And one of the things we know is the flip side of rising prices in central cities is, is that it actually also means that urban areas have become less and less affordable. This is Manhattan, and uh, these are rising prices and these are declining permits. Just as you've actually, the city's gotten its act together, become safe, become economically viable, it's become more and more difficult to build. This is in substance a curse of former Anglo-Saxon colonies, that we, all of us have empowered our local communities, which then make it increasingly difficult to put up any new housing whatsoever. Um, I, I live in the home of this, right? I mean, it's not, it's not as if uh, Greater Boston is not a capital of this, of this business. But this is an area, right? Thinking about housing and construction. I'll skip over this right now. This is another way of thinking about this. So this is another portion of America, and along here I have population growth, which can be read as housing construction as well. Between 2000 and 2010, and I have housing prices over here. Now, normally, for those of you who have taken Economics 101, you know, you should think about this in terms of supply and demand. And if the only thing that differed across areas was that some areas had high demand, some areas had low demand, you expect to see high demand places that are both expensive and growing a lot. Right? Because after all, this area is attractive, right? It's, you know, a nice place, it's a pleasant place, it should have lots of building and lots of, lots of prices. Now, there are places here that are low demand, i.e. low price and low, low population growth. But here's the thing you should also take away from this. The places that are really expensive don't build a lot, and the places that build a lot aren't expensive. That is not compatible with the view that the only thing that differs is demand. Because look, there's demand for Las Vegas. There's a demand for Phoenix. There's demand for Atlanta. There's a demand for Dallas. There's a demand for Houston. Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, each added a million people between 2000 and 2010. You can't think there is a demand for these places. And yet they remain cheap because they build. Because they're capable of mass producing massive amounts of house at six or seven hundred dollars a square feet. Right? And the land is essentially free. Right? This is what these places look like. In these places, it's incredibly difficult to build. In some of these areas, this reflects natural barriers, but in a lot of them it's about man-made barriers to, to production. It's about 60 acre minimum lot sizes in Marin County, California. It's about an ever increasing web of barriers that make it difficult to build in the area. Right? This is not something that is unknown here as well. This is the relation between home rights and local land use regulation. This is from Demographia. This is, of course, Hugh Pavlovich, the great Christchurch, by window on Christchurch most of the time, given that I get huge emails, but it seems like four or five a day. Um, you know, this is the this is the Auckland up here, you know, highly, highly regulated, highly expensive, and then down here we have places that aren't regulated like Atlanta that are much that are much cheaper, um, you know, across across the world. Now, this is actually the one I was talking to someone beforehand about my enormous um, admiration for Jane Jacobs. Uh, and, and I do think she was a peerless analyst of urban, of urban conditions, but there were some things that she got wrong. Because, um, of course, she wasn't an economist, and so didn't have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a joke. Uh, 
but there are things actually where the, the systemic approach is actually worthwhile because the ground level approach led her to observe old buildings and new buildings and notice that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive, which led her to conclude that the way to preserve affordability was to make sure that nobody built any new buildings on top of old buildings. <laughs> the economists now start to chuckle. Uh, because that's not how supply and demand works. If you make sure that no one builds any new buildings on top of old buildings, you have no new supply to meet new demand, and that's exactly what's happened in New York, the greater Boston, and elsewhere, because of the web of increasingly difficult types of regulations. Um, and in New York, it's also been accompanied by preservation districts, right? So you don't need to look at the difficult effects that limiting construction, you don't have to look any further than Jane Jacobs' own home at Greenwich Village, a place that was affordable for ordinary people like herself and her husband in the 1950s. Uh, when she worked so hard to create a preservation district which essentially shut down construction in Greenwich Village after 1967. Um, townhouses now start, I'm reliably told, at $8 million. Okay? It has become a boutique area affordable only to the hyper wealthy. Now, I am the son of an architectural historian. I believe in preserving our oldest buildings, which are part of our precious heritage. Right? On the other hand, not every old building needs to be preserved. Right? And there's a lot of mediocrity that's mixed in with the gems. And we have to be keenly aware, and I think that's the larger lesson, whatever you think of in terms of preserving old buildings, and you know, it's not an economist's business to, to, to opine on what, what tastes are. But do be aware there is no such thing as a free lunch here. You can't both be for affordability and in favor of massive preservation. Okay? The two things are not compatible. You have to weigh off trade-offs with one or the other and then figure out where that, where that takes you. Um, now, the, the, the real tragedy you know, of, of excessive limitations occurs in places like Mumbai, which has labored under some of the most draconian land use regulations in the world over the past 50 years, and as a result has spread out rather than up. Floor area ratios of one and a quarter in much of the central downtown area. Uh, increasingly, they've allowed some building up, but only by allowing lots of green space around those buildings. So in a city like Mumbai, which should be met with you know, buildings that are connected by pedestrian walkways and it's easy to get around, it sprawls, it moves out rather than up. And that's sort of one of the reasons why allowing building up in places like this makes sense. That it's an antidote to the endless sprawl, especially the dysfunctional public transportation that these areas make possible. Now, one of the reasons, and I'll end on this anecdote, one of the reasons why developing, developed world cities uh, should cherish their cities, not necessarily favor them, certainly, but not discriminate against them either, is that cities are actually not enemies of the environment. They're actually friends of the environment. Now, I'll illustrate this point with a story about a young college graduate who, a beautiful spring day in 1844, went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good. And when he came to cook the fish into the chowder, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass. And the fire started, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it had destroyed more than three acres, 300 acres a prime wood, a whole little natural ecosystem, wiped out by the carelessness of this young man. In his own day, he was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The conquered Freeman called him a liberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. <laughs> and it's hard not to think that on net they were right, because I don't know of anyone living in New York, or Cambridge, or Boston, this in 1844 did as much damage to the environment as this young man did. He is, of course, Henry David Thoreau. Currently, the secular saint of American environmentalism, his book Walton appears to preach a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. His own life does seem to teach different gospel. His own life appears to, to, to tell the moral that we are a destructive species. And often, if you love nature, the best thing in the world is to stay away from it. And the world would have done nature a great deal of good if he had stayed at home in Cambridge instead of going out and lighting fires in the middle of the woods. <laughs> now, uh, there is a modern version of this. Uh, together with Matthew Kahn, who's the environmental economist, we've, we've estimated carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of the country for a standardized household. And what you find is because of the difference in the amount of driving, and the amount of energy use associated with home energy consumption, particularly because of larger homes outside the urban core. The, pe the areas that look green are brown, and the areas that are brown look green. And I found that for myself. When I started acquiring small children, uh, only economists talk about acquiring small children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> here, where I had a nice, narrow environmental footprint, like most of the people in the central city area, out to here, right, surrounded by those beautiful woods, not that far away from Walton Pond, doing almost as much damage to the environment as poor Thoreau did. Right, so, uh, you know, the, the things that I'm willing to do is to engage in research, right? Uh, you know, so, so the, so, you know, and, and this is finally about driving and home heating. Now, one way to think about this is that the great growing economies of India and China see that per capita carbon emissions rise to the level seen in the sprawling United States. Global carbon emissions go up by about 130%. 
If they stop at the level seen in, in wealthy, but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. Ask yourself whether or not the suburbs that are surrounded by greenery, like the one I live in, right, right are particularly friendly to the environment relative to those spires in, in Hong Kong. Because in fact, those spires provide a much more environmentally sensitive model for the, for the future than in fact does that massive decentralization of, of living spaces. Now that being said, and I want to make sure of two final points, one of which is that I'm an economist, not a lifestyle consultant. And part of the point of making myself into this is to make the point that I believe that our countries are great because they offer different options. Because they don't, in fact, try to shoehorn people into one model of living. The choices are a hallmark of great cities, which would be art for Legos and neighborhoods. And choices are the hallmark of great countries, which would offer lots of different options. And it's a great thing that New Zealand has the opportunity to live in rural Canterbury and in Queenstown or in Auckland. It's a wonderful thing that those options are available to you just as they are available to me in the, in the U.S. The point of government policy right, is to not favor one of those things versus the other. It's to enable people to have different choices and to then you know, just charge people for the social cost of their action. Okay. That being said, at the national level, that is the policy, but it's also the policy of local leaders, perhaps with national support, to then engage in placemaking, right? That just in the sense that it is not at all incompatible for a economist to simultaneously tell the government not to favor one firm over another, but then to go in and try and help that a particular firm do better. It is simultaneously not at all compatible, incompatible to say at the national level, be spatially neutral, don't favor Detroit over Des Moines, but at the same time go in and try to help Detroit make you know, life, life better. So at the same time, the sort of opportunities, these choices are a wonder of our countries, you know, it is still entirely right, appropriate, and necessary good to fight for the rebuilding, the recreation of um, Christchurch. And I think the lesson is, I think also, of this urban history, is that no matter how difficult the problem is, the ability of cities to solve their own problems is enormous. Right? That's what we've had over the last 3,000 years. Seen cities solve their transportation problems, solve their health problems. Think about Jon Snow figuring out how cholera was spread by looking at a map around a water pump in, in London. Mm -hmm. um, think about the innovations in Chicago that may enable the problem of building up. Right? Smart people can make a city work. And no matter how troubled we are by the enormous challenges, whether created by earthquakes or climate change or economic recession, the track record of our species to work miracles when we learn from each other in urban areas is phenomenal. And I have seen nothing about around me in Christchurch other than human talent other than smart, creative people who seem remarkably good not just to come in with their own ideas, but from learning from each other. And I think given that, I cannot help but be enormously optimistic about this city and its ability to be built. Thank you.